Brighton Beach after Zap Club um, on a Tuesday morning around seven, eight, nine o'clock in the morning. The most surreal thing, dancing on that beach, watching people in Brighton go about their daily business and go to work. In Joe's box full of photos is the story of someone transformed by Acid House. The stage was a place for, the, for what we were called the nutters, the balmies. They would get up there and jump about like there weren't no tomorrow. I find myself back at my flat one night. This was 87. And the fellow who I let stay at my flat, he said, come, come with me. Come, I'm going this mad gaff. And um, he took me off to the, the, the first private, what well, I suppose you could call rave that I went to. And um, that was it, mate. It was all over. It was such a new thing. It was so different. Before this, Joe's recreational activities had been more devoted to a punch-up than getting loved up. English football, you could be forgiven for thinking, has never had it so bad. Scenes like these have seriously tarnished the game's image. I don't know if I liked myself pre-rave. There was a side of me that I didn't like. I mean, most of your life is devoted to following a football team and bashing up the, the other team supporters. It, it ain't really a lot to sort of crow about, as it were. There is a bit of a debate about whether rave had a soothing effect on the hooliganism that scarred the 80s. In the clubs, Joe felt the tensions between the football firms melt away. I don't recall uh, hearing any stories of there ever being any football clashes at a rave, ever. I can remember lots of instances where there'd be Arsenal in the basement, Tottenham in the back tunnel, and you know, Millwall here and a few others, and, and nothing ever happened. It was always sweet. I mean, when you consider that's the same person there, that's yours truly, 1974 outside the Spurs ground. And that's a completely different chap, isn't it? For me, the rave situation, yeah, blessing in disguise, really. If I'm honest about it, 90% of my friends now are probably rave orientated. Um, they're just you know, nicer people. No, you know, there's no easy way of putting it. In the years that Take That fans were spending all their money on branded filofaxes, ravers had become the subject of a full-blown moral panic under attack from all sides. I think the most worrying thing about the rave parties is the illegal use of drugs at them, and I would like to see much firmer action by the government on the drugs issue specifically. And by 94, the party was over. Parliament legislated against persons attending or preparing for a rave. And listen to this dry and spartan description of the life-changing, dynamic, beautiful sound that so many of us loved. Music includes sounds wholly or predominantly characterised by the emission of a succession of repetitive beats. Gotta be honest, it sounds like everything I actually like. But our demand for repetitive beats was unstoppable. We were now freaking out to a raft of new British dance sounds, from drum and bass to happy hardcore and jungle. And one band of hardcore ravers were now actually so big, they were appearing in every teen's favourite pop mag. Like any self-respecting fan, my Bible was smash hits. Therefore, it was crucially important that I obtained a copy of the compilation The Best of 1991, put together by the smash hit staff. I got it on cassette, took it home, slipped it into my pastel-coloured ghetto blaster and had a good listen. And it was there that I found this really weird song. It was nestling in probably between Amy Grant's one memorable hit, Baby Baby. And DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince of Summertime, which to be fair, is a deathless banger to this day. 
I was familiar with the hook because that appeared to be taken from a public information film that as a child I'd found terrifying, warning us about stranger danger. There was a cat in it and it was by a band who called themselves Prodigy. We're looking at the kids who are going out raving, mm. you know, giving them what they want. When they see all of us, they just see four people that ten minutes ago, before they got on stage, were in the crowd, sort of dancing around and having a laugh. In 1993, Prodigy were on the verge of dominating dance music in the mainstream. But they went back to their roots for one last rave-inspired night. I'm at the former legendary nightclub Limelight, meeting with Joe Vicharek, who was so addicted to the music, he had gone from raver to club promoter. He has some very rare footage from the most epic party of his life. These are the original high eight tapes, as it were, that I took way back then. And um, this is the original footage from Prodigy when they played at Bagley's October 1993. Oh, man. Yeah, I remember that very, very well indeed. I remember that one. Yeah. The first beat of that tune it erupted. Through this long hair. Looks like a mane, doesn't it? Goes right down his back. It's it's quite a... kind of metal, isn't it? Really? Uh, tell me. Yeah. They were starting to be really, really well established. Them, they, you know, they were bringing out albums, and you know, they'd already crossed over. But they come back and done a rave-oriented show for us. And you know what? Even now, goosebumps listening to that. I've got them. Seeing actually. it, and, and you know, being there, that, it was just incredible, mate. No better feeling. What you've captured here is such a hard thing to capture. It's such an ephemeral thing. It's a moment, isn't it? It's, it's a feeling, being in a room, sharing an experience with people. What the music meant. You know, sitting here now, um, I really do wish that, that those nights were next week, tomorrow, you know, happening right now, um, because they are moments of your life. You'll never ever be able to repeat that. I hope so, but I doubt it.